for criminals and every Pharisee. You came for hypocrites, even one like me. You carried sin and shame, the guilt of every man, the weight of all I've done, nailed into your hands. No, you're Jesus 
Jesus, only Jesus, who can command the highest praise, who has the name above all names, and you stand alone, and I stand amazed, and Jesus. friends, I'm glad you're here this morning, and man, it just seems like right now we are living in the middle of the chaos. You know, I mean, things are just going crazy, it seems, around us, and I know for a lot of us in our city, in our country, obviously, uh, in our church, uh, a lot of folks are uh, carrying a heavy burden around because of the, uh, the events going on in our society right now, and uh, just worried, worried, scared. Uh, fearful about what is going on, and they are in the middle of the chaos as well. Well, I want to invite you today to take your Bibles and go to Proverbs 4, verse 23. Proverbs 4, verse 23, and here's what that verse says. It says this, Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. And as believers, I just want to encourage you to guard your heart. Above all else, guard your heart, because uh, as your heart goes, so everything else in your life goes, because it is a wellspring of life. And all the events, all the thoughts, all the moods, all the actions flow out of your heart. And so if you can guard your heart and keep your heart focused on the right person and not on the events circling around us in the chaos, then you will be miles ahead of everyone else and you will be in great shape. But I need you to understand this, that your heart and my heart are constantly under attack, under attack from the enemy, Satan himself. 
And his missiles are not just aimed at us. He has actually launched these missiles, and they are directed towards our heart. Because if Satan can get you worrying, if Satan can get you doubting God's love for you, if Satan can get you doubting God's power, if, if Satan can get you doubting that God is truly at work, if he can divert your attention to anything else other than God himself, then he is doing a big number on you, and he is getting you right where he wants to get you. And so we don't want to give any foothold to, the, to Satan. We want to guard our hearts against him, against the missiles that he is sending in to us. Because once again, if he can get us thinking about the virus more than we do God himself, then he's got us in a great spot, Satan does. Or the chaos going on in our, uh, in our society right now. This is a picture of Atlanta, uh, where, where I grew up. And it's, I actually had my prom in that building, in the round building right there, so this is tough to, kind of, to see Atlanta in flames, per se. But if God can, um, excuse me, if Satan can get my attention diverted on what's going on in Atlanta or Portland or Minneapolis or anywhere else, or the culture at large, as opposed to God himself, if he can move these things to the front burner, burner of my heart, as opposed to God being at the very forefront and front burner of my heart, then Satan is getting me right where he wants to get me. And it's difficult not to worry and think about and ponder about and be scared of and fearful of what could happen with the economy and what happens now that you have lost your job or that your income is greatly reduced, and then you add an election uh, coming up in November to all the craziness going on right now. Wow. And then you start to think, well, now if I'm a college student, I'm heading back to school, and uh, I really don't like uh, learning online, but I'm going to have to be doing that pretty soon. You know, and, and what will um, this look like? What will my school year look like? What will the future look like? Wow, if Satan can just get our mind thinking on the what if game, you know, what if the future is not so bright for me? What will the future look like at all? Do I still have a future? What is going on? And Satan can easily divert our attention. If we're not careful, if we don't guard our hearts, he can divert our attention away from God into other things that he wants us to think about. So just remember the fact that our heart, your heart, is always under attack. And that you need to, you must, above all things, guard your heart and make sure that none of these missiles that are being shot towards you right now in this time, especially in the area of worry, are going to land on your heart and take hold of your heart. Because when these missiles, let's just say the missile of worry... If you are worrying and your eyes are off the Lord and you're now living in the middle of chaos because you've taken your eyes off the Lord and your eyes are on whatever Satan the enemy wants you to focus on and one of these missiles lands down in your heart, it causes a lot of collateral damage. And you'll be living in the middle of the chaos and the rubble if you don't guard your heart and keep your focus on who it needs to be on and that is God. So without God... Just understand that chaos rules. Without God, chaos rules. That's true in a culture. That's true, obviously, for society. It's true for you. That without God, chaos rules. Without God, chaos rules. For God is not a God of disorder, but God is a God of peace. But For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. So understand this. I understand that 1 Corinthians 14 is talking about uh, uh, order and worship. But this principle holds true for us today that for God is not a God of disorder. He's not a God of chaos. And where God is taken out of the mix, there will be chaos and there will be no peace. But God is a God of order. In fact, where God is, God brings order. God brings order, and therefore, since God is there, he brings order and he brings peace into a society, if they will let him in, into a person's life, 
if they will let him in. And so let's guard our hearts today. Let's look at some ways to, and things to remember, let's guard our hearts about reinforcing foundational truths about God. Just kind of like 101 basic things about God that we need to remember, that we need to reinforce in our minds, things that we may know as a believer. But today, when I use the term reinforcing, how I want to reinforce in our hearts is not just bringing back the knowledge if we have forgotten these things about God, but also applying who God is to our lives. So when we bring knowledge into our lives and apply that knowledge to our lives, that would bring us wisdom. And so reinforcing, I want us to apply these truths to our lives because when we do that, we have knowledge and wisdom. So let's guard our hearts by reinforcing foundational truths about God that may recalibrate our minds back out of the chaos into a place of peace because of who God is. So let's just start with God himself. Let's just start with God himself. In Genesis 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God. That there truly is a God. There is one out there who created it all, who is a very personal God, who's a very intimate God, who is a loving God towards you. You know, Scripture doesn't lay out a bunch of arguments for the existence of God because I think that for a logical person and a thinking man or woman, if you see the creation, then you think to yourself, there must be a creator. But for us just to remember as believers that God you do exist, you're alive and well, you're very personal, you're very aware, you're very intimate, you know everything that's going on in my life, and God, you are simply there. In the beginning, God. Let's rest on the fact that there is a God who is there. But if it were not true that there is a creator who is there, that is intimate, that is loving, that is involved in our lives, then there will be a chaos in every foundation of our lives. Because God is the ultimate foundation that other firm footings of our lives spring off of, and we build off of this one foundation, that there is a God. And so without God, maybe you believe there is no God. Maybe you believe that that he, there is no creator, that we're just here by uh, natural selection. We're just here by random chance. Well, without God in the picture, there is chaos in every foundation of your life. And so if you're a believer today, or even a non-believer, I, I want to draw back to your attention the truth that there is a God. And you don't have to live in the chaos. You can build your life off the strong foundation that there is a God there. How about this? The next thing, that God is holy, that there is a God, and he's in love with you, but there is a God there. And that this God, our God, is a holy God. Look at Revelation 4, verse 8. And check out, think in your mind as I read the front part of this passage out of Revelation Think about what these creatures may look like. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. And day and night, they never stopped saying, in fact, they're saying this right now, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come that our God is a holy God. He is a perfect God. He has no character flaws in him. That there is a God and our God is holy. And since our God is holy, he has the authority and has laid down what is right and wrong to us. He has told us, through his word, what is right and wrong. He has given us, given us 
and ethic. He has given us morality because he is a holy God that has given him the authority to do so because he is the only holy one. Now, if there were no God, and if God was not, were not holy, then there will be chaos in morality. There will be chaos in morality. If we believe that there is no holy God, then therefore, that if our God were not holy, he could not give us any sense of ethic. Or if we act like there is no God, there will be chaos in our morality, and we would simply live however we want and choose to live, which sounds so much like our culture today, that our culture vastly does not believe that there is a God, that there is a creator, that there is a God there who is involved, that there is a holy God, and therefore, since there is no creator or holy God or authority that has given us any sense of morality, then we can act however we choose to act. Now, that's not to say if if you don't believe in God, that you can't be a moral person. It's just the fact that you have no real reason to be a moral person when it gets right down to it. If there were no holy God that gave us our morality or ethic, then you truly can act however you want to act. And you can truly do whatever you want to do. I mean, true, that may not be good for society, and true, you may get locked up for it, but in the end of it, when you're pushed on it, there is no real reason no real, real reason why you can't act like you want to act. But since there is a holy God, since there is an authority who gave us our morality and our ethic and let us know what is right and wrong, then it gives us the basis of how we should act and the basis of our morality. But you look around our culture. By the way, you look around... You turn on any newscast at any time during the day on any channel you want to go to. You look at any paper across the country, if anybody reads paper, the newspaper anymore, but you look at any paper across the country in any city on any day, and you tell me that chaos and morality is not all up and down the pages of the paper and all across the newscast. You tell me if that's not true. You tell me if that's not where we are today. Well, we're talking about guarding our heart. Guarding our heart, that believers, we're going to guard our heart with the knowledge and the wisdom. And we're going to live our lives knowing that there is a God and He is um, holy. He is there. And that He is also a sovereign God. Look at these passages in Psalm Uh, two in Psalms and one in Proverbs. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. What does sovereignty mean? What what, what does the the God is sovereign? What does sovereign mean? Simply means this, that God does whatever he chooses to do. That God does whatever he chooses to do. Now we take great assurance in that as believers because our God is a holy God and does no wrong, and all of his decisions are correct. But God does whatever he chooses to do. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. There is no no other kingdom that can rise up and overtake his kingdom. They do not have that power because he is the sovereign one. Look at Psalm 135, 6. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth and the seas and all the deeps. Proverbs 19, 21, many are the plans in the mind of man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. That our God is sovereign. Rest in this, believers. Guard your heart with this during the middle of all the chaos right now. Guard your heart with the fact that our God is the sovereign one and that his plans will stand. But it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. And he is accomplishing his purposes. He has that power. He has that sovereignty to accomplish his purposes. Even through the chaos going on right now, he is accomplishing purposes. But if it were not true, if it were not true that we have a God who is sovereign, that I would be nervous. In fact, I would be scared. I would be very 
uneasy during these times because if we did not have a God who is the sovereign one, then chaos, you would have chaos in who's in control. And isn't that true right now? When, when, there, when people live as if there is no God, and believers, I just want to remind you, even though you are a believer, there are times when practically speaking, you can lose sight of these things and practically live as if God is not sovereign and God is not in control. And you may think the circumstances at hand are in control, or these are just random happenings, but that is not the case. God is sovereign. But when we act like, or society acts like, there is no God who is sovereign, then you have major control issues. You have chaos in control. And when people think there is no one in control, then they start to think, well, I can be in control. And then you start having power struggles. You start having power struggles all around you. You look around our country right now, and you see power struggle after power struggle after power struggle after power struggle on every level of everything. Power struggles. Because they feel like, hey, no one's in control. I don't believe there's a God in control, so I should be in control. On a personal level, those of us who feel like, God, maybe you left me, or these things about God, God's sovereignty is not in the forefront of our mind, the idea that creeps into our heart, if we don't guard our heart, that maybe I should be in control of my own life, or the outcome of my life is totally up to me, but that is not true, because God is a sovereign God. Guard your heart with these things. Guard your heart with these character qualities of who our God is. Let it give you strength. Let it guard your heart, because out of your heart springs the, the wellspring of life. Every area of your life springs out of your heart, and so make sure to guard your heart with these things about God, with God himself. How about this, that God works all things for his glory. We have a God who is holy, who is sovereign, and he works all things for his glory. That even these terrible things that are going on right now in our culture, and maybe terrible things that are going on in your personal life, they are all working for the purpose of God's glory. Look at Psalm 19, 1 through 4. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. Knowledge of what? Knowledge of how awesome God is and how glorious he is. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world, saying God is glorious. Glory to God. Glory to God. And so when you go out on a starry summer night, maybe a night like tonight, and you look up to the heavens and see the stars, just understand what they are saying, understand what they are proclaiming as they twinkle. They are proclaiming the glory of God. That's what they're communicating to you. And so guard your heart with that. Guard your heart. Every time you go out and look up at a starry sky, just say, yes, God, you're there. And, and all these things that are going on, somehow, some way, can we explain this? No, but somehow, some way, all of this will work out for your glory for your glory. And guess what, God? We're about that too. We're about your glory, God, more than we're about our glory, more than we're about a comfortable life. God, we're about your glory. And so do what you need to do. Work out things how you need to work things out. But God, we want to pray and echo the stars and what they're communicating that, we, God, we believe that you are worth all the glory that you receive, that you, you cannot receive enough glory, but God, we want you to be glorified. And if you see fit to take us through whatever you need to take us through, personally or as a culture, for you to receive glory, then we're right there with you. And we're going to be waving your flag. Well, look at John 12, 27. This is Jesus talking, by the way, talking about the glory of God and that God is about his glory, and he's accomplishing that purpose to bring himself 
glory. But Jesus says, now is my soul troubled. He's heading directly for the cross. I mean, the cross is right there in front of him. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Father, save me from this hour. No, for this purpose I have come to this hour. For this purpose I have come to this hour. Well, what purpose is that? Father, glorify your name. I've come to this hour for this purpose, for your glory, for the salvation of man. Because when men are saved through your grace and mercy, God the Father, it gives you great glory. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice, then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it. The Father said to Jesus Christ, oh, I have glorified my name before, and I will glorify it again. Specifically, when you're on the cross, I will glorify it again through that. We see that all of history is under the sovereign hand of God, and the future is under the sovereign hand of God, and the present is under the sovereign hand of God. And it is bringing God glory. And he says in Isaiah 48, verse 11, I will not yield my glory to another. God is incredibly stingy with his own glory. He will not yield it to another. But if there is no God working out the purposes of his glory, that the event that is their purpose to bring God glory then there is chaos in purpose. Then you had to ask yourself the question, well, why are all these things happening? Why, 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 you know, why is there the virus? And why is there the, the negative financial uh, downturn? And why did I lose my job? And why did I get sick? And why, 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 why? Why are all these things happening? What is the purpose in this? What is the rhyme or the reason? Well, as believers, we can say, hey, we don't have it all figured out how God's going to accomplish this, but God, through all of this, is receiving glory and will ultimately receive glory. But if you believe there's no God or live your life as if there is no God, then these are all random, crazy, chaotic acts with no rhyme and no reason. Before since the creation of the world, listen to what it looks like when men and women have that thought that there is no rhyme or reason, that God, we don't think living for your glory is enough. What does that look like? Well, look at Romans chapter 1, verse 20 and following. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made from like the stars in the sky. So that people are without excuse. Without excuse about what? That there is a God, that there is a creator there that loves them. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. And although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal, immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. So these folks in Romans chapter 1 said, you know what, God? We don't think you are worthy to live for. Your glory is not enough to live for. What we're going to do is we're going to make uh, images that look just like me, Look just like us, in images that look like birds and animals and reptiles, and we're going to worship them instead, and we're going to glorify them instead. Forget you, God. We're going with the man-made statue that looks just like me. And therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desire of their hearts. And God said, okay, if that's the way you want it, that's the way you can get it, and I'll just take my hand off of you and give you over to your sinful desires of your wicked heart. Tough place to be. Detrimental place to be, my friends. Well, how about this? As we guard our hearts with the truth 
that God works all things for your good. That, all, that God works all things for your good. You're like, oh, Elliot, I don't even know if, if I even believe this one now. How, how is all this chaos going on around us working things out for my good? How is me getting sick working this out for my good? How is me losing my job working this out for my good? I mean, you explain that to me. Well, let me try. Romans 8, 28 and 29 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Verse 29 that we, in verse 29, we really get a glimpse in seeing what the good is. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. See, we tend to think, when we hear Romans 8, 28, that God works all things for the good of those who love him, well, we think automatically that good means our comfort and our ease and that all will go well with us. And that's how we define good. But in verse 29, the good is defined as being conformed to the image of his son. In other words, the good in our life is when God makes us through trials through some tribulations, through difficult circumstances, when God makes us more like Jesus Christ. So let's read verse 28 in light of verse 29 and what the good is. And we know that in all things God works for the good, or we know that in all things God makes me more like Jesus Christ. He makes me more like Jesus Christ. Those who love him, God makes more like Jesus Christ. And that's a very good thing. In fact, we're about that. In fact, we're about, God, your glory. So you do whatever you need to do to glorify yourself. And God, you know what? Because I love you, I want to be more like you. And so, God, you do whatever you need to do in my life to make me more like you. And I will say that is good. That is good. But if we if you believe there is no God or we live as if there is no God, practically speaking, then there would be chaos in your pain and in your heartache because they would just be random acts of pain and heartache for no purpose whatsoever. They wouldn't be glorifying God and they wouldn't be making you more like Jesus Christ. They would be serving no other purpose other than pain for the sake of pain and heartache for the sake of heartache if there were no God. But we believe as believers, and we're going to guard our heart with the truth that there is a God who is working in the chaos, and he works all things together for our good, to make us more like Jesus Christ. And so we can handle the pain, and we can handle the heartache, because we know that God is accomplishing the purpose through that. He's making us more like Jesus Christ through the pain and the heartache. And so in some strange type of way, we say, hey, maybe uh, the more pain, the better. Maybe, maybe the more heartache, even the better, if it makes me more like Jesus Christ, I can deal with it. We're not just crumbling down under the weight of the chaos. Because we start to think, well, God, you do have a rhyme and a reason. You do have purposes you are setting forth. And so we can guard our hearts knowing that you have your hands firmly on the steering wheel and you are totally in control of what is going on. You are accomplishing the purpose, purposes that you have set out to accomplish. Well, switching gears just a tad, how about this next thing we're going to remember about God and us? That God created man in his image. That God created man and woman in his image. Look at Genesis 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. That God created man with a, a body, soul, and a spirit, like the Trinity himself, with a mind, will, and emotion. That we are all created red and yellow, black and white. We are all created in the image of God, which means that we all have intrinsic value. 
that we all stand equal before God in our very worth that God gives us because we are created in the image of God himself. But if we believe that there is no God, or we believe that there is no creator, or we believe that it is survival of the fittest, we're going to have mass chaos in our relationships with each other. Let me ask you a question and think through this with me. If you believed that truly there is no creator, it is survival of the fittest, that's what a vast a good portion of our society believes survival of the fittest. Let me ask you this question. What would keep me, if it is true there is no God who has a holy God that has given us a morality, and there is no God that created us um, with in, all with intrinsic built-in value, and I do believe that it is survival of the fittest, then what would be wrong with me trying to push another race down, push another person down when it really gets down to it. Because if it truly is survival of the fittest, then I'm going to do everything I can to push everyone else down so I can rise to the top. And if there is no God, there's no real reason not to do that. In fact, if there is no God, then you can make a very strong case that racism would be okay if there is no God, if there is no God, if there is no creator, if we do not all have built-in value because we're created in the image of God, well, if there is no God, then it's just, hey, each of you survive survival of the fittest, and I'm going to push down anybody else I can push down. You think about that. You think about that. There will be chaos, and there is chaos in our relationships, look across our culture. God is moved out of our culture. Chaos moves into our culture. And it's been there for a very long time in the form of racism and other relationship issues. Because without God in the picture, without God in the mix, chaos rules the day. It will certainly rule the day in relationships. Let's look at God's Word. We're almost done, but let's look at God's Word. We're going to guard our heart knowing that God has given us His Word, His very words, His intentional words. He has given to us. Look at these passages, classic passages. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that all Scripture is God-breathed, that God has given us His Word to know how to live our lives as a rule book, as a standard to live our lives by. All Scripture is God-breathed, which sets it apart from any other holy book. That It is actually God-breathed and can back up those claims and what it is and is useful for teaching and rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Look at 2 Peter 1, verses 20 to 21. Above all, you must... Understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. In other words, the prophets weren't just making this stuff up. For prophecy, for prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. We have God's Word to help guide us through life, but without God's Word, Meaning that if God never gave us his word or we live practically as if there is no word of God to know how to live our lives by, which you can, even as a believer, you can be a believer and never be in the word of God, never open your word, keep it on your dashboard, don't know what it says, and you will not know how to live your life. So practically speaking, it's kind of like a practical atheism in a certain way like that. Or culture as a whole would say, you know, we don't believe the Word of God is true, and we're certainly not going to live our lives by it. We certainly don't think it is God-breathed. Well, if that's the case, you're going to have chaos in authority and in the standard by which we live by. 
And you look around, once again, in any newscast, on any day you want to choose, in any time of the day you want to choose, or any newspaper you want to read, and tell me there's not chaos in authority. And that men and women are just living however they choose to live their lives. They're doing what is right in their own eyes and not what is right by the God-breathed Word of God. And we wonder why there's so much um, craziness going on, so much fighting authority. Well, because there's chaos and authority and the standard in which we should live by. Last thing is this, that we're going to guard our hearts by knowing that Jesus, period, has taken care of business for us on the cross. That Jesus, period, is taking care of business for us on the cross. That he has died for us on the cross. He shed his blood for us on the cross. He forgave us of our sins. He gave us holiness. He took away the penalty for our sins and gave us his, his holiness. And therefore, we're able to go to heaven when we die. And so as believers, we're going to guard our hearts with the fact that Jesus accomplished all that was needed to be done for salvation on the cross. And that all we need to do is repent of our sins and place our faith in him alone for salvation. And when that truth becomes a reality in your life, that that life is a win-win. I mean, whatever happens in life, it's a win because God will receive the glory and God is making you more like Jesus Christ. And it's a win also, even if you die, because you die and go to heaven. It's a win-win for believers any way you want to slice it. But for non-believers, they think, that well, there is no God, and he certainly has uh, no son that came down in his exact representation and died for us on the cross to pay for our sin debt. That's just foolish talk, some may say. And there will be chaos. There will be chaos in salvation. There will be chaos in the thoughts of how am I saved then if, they, if, those, if some people ever think about that. See, Acts 4.12 says, Salvation is found in no one else. For there is in no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. But when you take God out of the picture and his clear plan of salvation, then chaos in our, in our salvation or how to be saved would become very chaotic. In other words, I'm saying this to you, that you would think, well, am I, am I saved by my good works? Let me try that out. I'm, I'm, do I need to try to even up the scales? Do I just need not to worry about it? Do I just think that, that uh, everything will turn out okay in the end? Do I even need to be saved? All these options come into your mind because there's chaos in salvation when we take out God's clear plan of salvation through Jesus, period. Well, we're going to, as believers, we're going to guard our hearts with all of these things in the middle of these trying times, these chaotic times. We are not going to live as if there is no God. We're going to practically live as if all these characteristics and more are true about God because they are true. And we're going to guard our hearts in that. And we're going to rest assured in peace in Him alone who can bring us peace and pull us out of the chaos. Well, that would be a great testimony, my friends, if you, in the middle of the chaos, were not so chaotic that you had peace in the middle of all this chaos and you were able to let your friends know when they may ask, well, hey, everybody else around me is freaking out. Why aren't you freaking out? Well, it's not because I don't think I can be infected by the virus. I can be infected by the virus. It's not because negative things can't happen to me. No, negative things can happen to me. It's just that I find my peace in God himself, and not in the circumstances around me. That we find our peace in one that supersedes the culture, 
and supersedes what's going on all around us. So my friends, if you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, I want to ask you today, would you please consider doing that and do that today? And friend, I also want to encourage you, if you are a believer and you may have forgotten these very basic things about God, or if you are living as though they are not true, that you would refresh yourself in the knowledge and put them into practice and become wise in these areas and rise above the chaos. Well, church family, I love you. We've got some great things uh, in plan for Victory Day that's coming up. It's going to be a very special and different Victory Day this year. Just want to let you know about that. We've got some ministries cranked up that are going to minister to our teachers, to our police officers, to our firefighters. And so when we're together prayerfully and hopefully next Sunday, please bring your prepackaged, wrapped up tight, candy, chips, good things for the teachers that we're going to deliver out and in the next weeks to come to the police and to the fire. But I do want to pray that you would be uh, in prayer for me and our church staff as we make decisions. I want to pray that you be in prayer for our church family, for each other. And some of our church family are going through difficult times right now, that you would pray for them and lift them up and be a great church family to each other. Stay in communication with each other. Keep up with your Sunday school classes uh, and your friends. And uh, we will be back together very soon, my friend. But until we see each other again, uh, I wish you well and that the Lord be with you. Let me pray for us as we go. Well, Father, I do want to pray that you would really burn this message to our hearts. And when we lose sight of who you are, Lord, that that you would bring back who you are full-fledged in our hearts, and that our hearts would be guarded by you, that we would be in your word, that you would help to recalibrate our minds and our hearts back to you every single day in Scripture, and that your Holy Spirit would do a great work in our lives, and that you would raise raise us up to be towers of strength. Lord, our theme this year is rise, and that you would rise us up to be towers of strength. And for us not to fall prey to the chaos all around us. But that we would be clear in the message of salvation that you've given us. Lord, be with my friends. I want to pray that you give them a great week this week and that you would bring us back together next Sunday, physically gathered right here in this room. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Blessed assurance Jesus is mine Oh, what a full taste Glory divine An heir of salvation Purchase of God Born of His Spirit Washed in His blood Perfect submission All is at rest I in the same my 
Savior all the day 